Hi, everybody. And thank you so much for joining this evening's webinar with Mala and Wahid Invest. <clears throat> My name is Zainab Khan, and I am the executive director and one of the co founders of Mala, the Muslim American Leadership Alliance. As many of you may know, um, we are a nonprofit that focuses on cultivating leadership and celebrating heritage within the Muslim American community. The COVID crisis has definitely affected each and every one of us. And I hope that you all are staying safe at home and are healthy. And we're here together as a community. Uh, Mala is known for having wonderful events in Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C., and we look forward to reconvening and coming back together uh, when it's safe and when we are cleared from this pandemic. Um, meanwhile, I did want to provide an update. Um, so as we have pivoted to have our community programs online, please do sign up for our newsletter to stay updated. Follow us on social media at Mala National and you will see a plethora of wonderful programs through our partners, through our sponsors, through our community leaders that we will be hosting via Zoom. So again, thank you once more. The reason why we chose this topic was because we did conduct a community assessment and survey across thousands of people that are within the Mala network. And one of the large issues that did keep popping up was, you know, what's going to happen to my investments? What's going to happen to my portfolio? What's going to happen to my retirement funds? How do I navigate the market during this crisis? And so we're very pleased today to have Saad um, from Wahid Invest. He is the VP of Wahid Invest in North America. And I want to thank him for his support, for his partnership. And I will now introduce Flex, our deputy director, to give a few words of welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Zainab. And I'm going to keep my um, remarks very uh, brief because I want to get into the uh, presentation with uh, Saad. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ahmed Flex Omar, the Deputy Director for MALA. I want to echo uh, Zainab's uh, sentiments and want to wish, um, you know, in, in this current crisis, you know, to be safe and uh, practice, you know, uh, the guidelines that are issued by our government and the CDC. Um, MALA is a community or organization, you know, at heart, we're a grassroots uh, movement. So even though we're not able to do our events, you know, um, that we're known for on a monthly base, on a monthly basis all over the country, um, we're still able, you know, to bring you um, events, you know, online. And thank you all for being part of our, you know, kickoff uh, webinar series that we're going to be uh, doing uh, forward. Uh, please make sure to uh, tell your friends about our you know, a newsletter and make them you know, sign up as well because we're going to be uh, putting together some um, interesting um, panel uh, discussions that are coming you know, your way. Uh, but today, um, the topic is um, how to navigate the current market you know, uh, crisis. A little bit of background about me, I was in accounting and uh, finance and I was in hedge funds around 2008, you know, when the uh, recession um, happened and the market, you know, uh, cr uh, crashed. So I've, I have personal experience, you know, uh, with that. And for, at that time, I knew a lot of people were worried and concerned about, you know, what's going to be happening, you know, to their finances, to their future. And, you know, like we got through that period, we're going to get through this period, you know, as well. But the only way we're going to do it is by um, reaching out to, you know, smart, you know, folks and people that are experts on different uh, topics. And one of those people is uh, my good friend, Saad. And uh, Saad, I'm going to let you uh, take it uh, from here and run your um, uh, presentation. And then I'll, um, at the end of the presentation, I can help with the Q&A. Thank you so much. 
That sounds great. Thank you so much, Zainab and Flex. First of all, guys, thank you so much for the amazing work that Malo is doing. Uh, I got to learn about it through you, Flex, a while back when we connected. Um, so yeah, uh, hi everyone. My name is Saad Zarif. I'll do a quick introduction about myself in a minute, but I work for a company called Wahid Invest. That is a Sharia compliant to an ethical digital robot platform that provides investment services. Uh, but today I'm more about sort of the educational side of what's going on with this COVID-19 crisis. A lot of people have been worried about, hey, what's happening with my investments? How should I navigate these markets? So that's what we're here for. So today, the agenda, I'm just going to briefly do a quick sort of background about my experience. Then we're going to talk about briefly, and I'm sure some of you are already familiar with investments, but I always like to do a quick rerun of the basics. So we're all always on the same page about what stocks and bonds are, I will talk about the emotional value of investing. I'm going to cover, of course, everything related to current market volatility. What does that really mean? Look at some historical data. And then a lot of times people ask that, okay, if I do want to invest in this current environment because the market is low, how do I go about doing that? Where should I invest? Also, in terms of Mala as being a nonprofit organization, you should be finding ways to support it as well. One of the smarter ways is through charitable giving, and that is something I'm going to cover. And then towards the end, a couple of tips here and there, the strategies to apply when you're investing, and then of course we'll open up to Q&A. This is more of a town hall style, so again, I'm gonna try and limit my conversation as much as possible, but just provide enough content for you guys to be able to ask questions. So again, as I mentioned, I've been with Wide Invest since their inception, which was about two and a half years ago. I have just over 15 years of experience uh, within the private equity and the private wealth management space. I've worked in firms where I've managed in excess of 500 million in assets for both individuals and institutional businesses. Uh, in 2007, I actually moved um, to America from England where I studied and just like Flex, I actually have a degree in accounting, uh, but I quite early on realized that auditing was not for me. No offense to anyone here who might be an accountant or loves auditing. Fair play to you. I admire that, but it just wasn't for me. I felt like I wanted to be more involved with people. And that's where this industry kind of came about. Uh, so in 2007, I got a great opportunity after working in private equity in Switzerland to um, uh, work for a brokerage, brokerage firm in New York on uh, 60 Wall Street, actually. And... Um, that was 2007 and of course 2009 uh, the very well-known market crash happened so i kind of experienced it firsthand taught me a lot about how money should really in an ethical way should be managed for clients i spent uh, a brief amount of time at Morgan stanley which is an investment bank managing some assets there i've also worked for a company called advisor shares it's actually based in bethesda maryland uh for those of you that might be from the area uh, they're one of the larger exchange traded funds providers and then, of course, for the last five years, I've been primarily working uh, within the Muslim community and educating people about investments. Uh, so that's me. This is part of my team uh, from Wahid. We were the first Sharia compliant investment firm to actually ring the opening bell at NASDAQ last summer when we launched our fund, Halal, HLAL. A lot of people can use it however they want it, their various investments. So it was a beautiful experience to be in New York and bringing the bill uh, by an ethical firm. So let's get into it. Let's take a quick dive. Um, understanding stocks and bonds. The basic definition of stocks, as we understand, is ownership in a business that is publicly traded. Say, for example, Apple, you buy one share of Apple, it makes you an owner at a fractional level in Apple. Now, if Apple does really well, they make good money, they may choose to give you what's called a dividend income, a small portion based on how many shares you hold, you'll get an income and that's called dividend. So that's what makes you a shareholder in a company or a stockholder. Hey, I buy stocks, which means I buy a small portion of a publicly traded company. Bonds, on the other hand, are basically debt instruments. They allow you to leverage debt from a company and have a, a non-ownership. Basically, in debt, you don't own anything. In bonds, you're just owning the debt of the company and they promise to pay you interest based off that. Uh, bonds are usually used by much older people that are looking for less what's called volatility and kind of limit their losses, uh, sorry, limit their gains as well. So stocks, again, can be more aggressive, but they also give you better returns than bonds. The one big difference I always like to cover is what is the difference between an index fund and a mutual fund? A lot of times people ask that. It's almost the same difference as between what's called passive versus active investing. If you look at the image in front of you on the left-hand side, this is what an index fund looks like. Say, for example, S&P 500. Most people have heard about it top 500 companies that are invested in the stock market, 
okay? They give us the length and, length and breadth of our economy. They give us an idea about how our economy is performing as well. Now, if you were to invest in an index fund, whether it should be a mutual fund or an ETF, it means you're getting the entire index, the entire deck of cards, for example. So that is what you get. If there's an index fund that mimics the S&P 500, that fund will have all of those 500 stocks in it. Um, it's less cheaper. What do I mean by that? The fee that the fund charges. A lot of times people don't even know how much they're paying in fee. So you should always pay attention to that. And I'll come to it later on as well. Um, so index funds allow you to tap into the entire broader market. Whereas a, let's say a mutual fund that is actively managed will have only a few stocks. If you look at the image, literally imagine these blocks as companies. A mutual fund may have only 30 or 40 stocks in it, but it might be taking them out from the S&P 500. So the top performing 30, 40 stocks, they'll put, put it in a bucket, trade it, buy and sell every few months, but they could charge you well over 1% on it. So always be aware of the fact that at the end of the day, actively managed and passive investing comes at a cost. Uh, Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, that died, uh, I, I think, about uh, a few months ago, uh, was a big proponent of index funds because he said that that's how, over the long run, you can make more money in the market. Not everyone can beat the market. Not everyone can just make a ridiculous amount of money by just buying a few stocks. If you get lucky, that's different. But index strategy is long-term, it's passive, it allows your funds to grow over time, irrespective of market volatility. So be aware of that. Okay, so let me ask you guys a quick question. If I was to ask you all, what do you think you're afraid of the most when it comes to investing, what would you say? I think you guys should be able to use the chat box to sort of uh, throw a couple of answers. And we'll just take a few seconds to do this, but I just want to know what do you think is your investment crutch? What either stops you or worries you when you're investing your money in the market? What would you say? If you can type anything in the um, chat box, that would be great. For questions, uh, they will be addressed towards the end of the webinar, but do keep them coming as you go along. Yeah, and I'm hoping that everyone can hear me clearly as well. So in order to give you an idea, the one thing that most people say that they are most afraid of is losing money. And also the reality is that we have an emotional attachment to our money as well. So when people invest their money in the stock market, the first thing they do is when they make decisions to pull their money out during these current volatile times, the decision is not logical. It's actually irrational. Is based on your emotional attachment to your money rather than the logical thinking of what are my future goals? Why am I investing? And the reality is that our goals are dynamic, just like our life is. We change over time, our personalities change, we grow older, your goals will change as well. So your investments should be aligned with your goals. That's what most financial advisors use the term as. But in order to be a smart investor, you cannot have emotional attachment to your money. You need to be more focused on your goals. So the next time you're looking to make a decision that's based on the noise around you, make sure you ask yourself, am I making this decision based on my emotional attachment to my money? Or am I focused on my goals and I've achieved my goals, so maybe now is a good time for me to pull some of my investment money out. Very important to understand this. This is a graph I'm going to use. It's from a uh, business called Behavior Gap. Uh, and I would highly recommend you guys should look it up. I have no relationship with this guy, but he's very smart, writes some really cool content. So I love this chart. If you can see, it says, how not to deal with a scary market. Reality is, and this is the consensus by most people, that I want to sell here, right at the bottom of the market when things are going down. But I plan to get back somewhere here when the market is going up. Basically, the reality is that this sort of curve that you see is how the market moves. It'll go up, it'll go down, it'll be stagnant, then it goes back up again. But the mindset of having the, hey, I'm going to sell at a specific time and then buy at a very particular time in the market is called timing the market. That just means you're genuinely just trying to gamble and hoping that you can strike a dart in the dark and it, hit, uh, in the dark and it hits a bullseye. It doesn't really work like that. You may get lucky once in a while, but that's not the strategy you want to get. So again, knowing that your emotional attachment to money may make you want to behave this way is not the ideal approach. It's more about, hey, I'll ride the wave because I have time ahead of myself. I know what my goals are. I know what my risk tolerance is. So now that we understand that psychology, what we should also realize that this teaches us that the stock market is a very uncertain place. And if there's uncertainty, then that also means that I am part of the realization group that the stock market has risk associated with it. 
Now, risk can be in two forms, either realized or unrealized. What do I mean by that? So you invest $1,000 and coronavirus just happened. Everything had to be forcefully shut down. And your portfolio is down by $200 to $800. That is unrealized loss because you've not collected that money yet. But if you decide to close your account and pull that money out, you have realized your losses. You have allowed the market risk and the uncertainty to win against you. So always understand that stock market is uncertain. Market risk is always there. If I'm not emotionally attached to my money and I focus on my goals, you will be much better off. So let me share with you guys something very quickly. 100 years of the Dow Jones. Dow Jones is another index, just like the S&P 500, but he has about 30 stocks in it. Um, and what this chart shows us, if you look at the blue line, it's so squiggly and up and down. This is the stock market showing you, oops, sorry, I just got a little bit too excited for a minute there. <laughs> My mouse was getting too hyper. Um, this is showing us that there is volatility in the market. Volatility is literally the up and down in the value of an index or a stock. And that this is how the stock market plays with our emotions, our money. But what you should notice is that given enough time, no matter what happens, when it goes up, it goes down, this is actually where my mouse is, is where the 2009 market crash happened. It consistently eventually tends to go in an upward direction. And that should be the focus here. But the reality is that nothing lasts forever. Whether there's good times in the market or bad, what lasts is the dynamic goals that we have set up for ourselves and how do we aim to achieve them. So don't let the volatility and the up and down in the market control your decisions. Let your goals be the deciding factor there. Between here, where the 09 market crash happened, where the stock market lost about 56% of its value, till literally last week, where, what this chart depicts, we pretty much made over, between 10 years, uh, from then up until I would say this year, January, over 495% return. So it is genuinely when they say that patience is a virtue, it quite literally is when it comes to investing. However, it's based on your age, your time horizon, the risk that you can take, and your lack of emotional attachment to money. So anytime you look at a graph that's showing squiggly lines, the first thing you should think about is that is, for some people, the market playing with their emotions. It shows that market risk exists, but give it enough time, is definitely going in an upward trend. So I wanted to share something with you guys, and I know there's a lot of numbers here, so don't be afraid. Just look at these, where the big arrow is of mine, the red and the, and the green numbers. Just focus on these, please, for me. What this shows you is 20 years of the S&P, or let's say the stock market performance. What you see in green are how many years out of 20 the market has been positive, where the year ended on a good note, and how many years it ended on a negative. Hey, for the whole year, the market was down. So if you do the math, I did this, um, I noticed that we've had almost 13 positive years out of 20 in the stock market, giving over a 200% return versus only about seven negative years in 20 years with 113% negative return. So quite honestly, the winners are those that are sticking to the market, not the ones that are finding the exact time to pull out and then get back in. doesn't work like that. What this also shows us that in the last two decades, a lot has happened. Um, I'm sure some of you may remember Y2K in early 2000 before we entered the millennium. Everyone talked about it, that the computers would go to zero, the world would come to an end as we know it. Boom, nothing happened. Unfortunately, 9-11 happened. Uh, we had multiple other flash crashes as well in the market. Uh, we've had various diseases during that time as well. When I was in England, it was mad cow disease. Uh, you've had all sorts of others. You know, we've talked about measles and so on. So things happen in life. Um, we just have to power through them. And now we're looking at coronavirus. And it's something I'm going to touch base on in a minute as to how it has forced our economy to slow down, but it's very unnatural because until recently everything was going fine. So this, to put things in perspective about how I work, how I look at numbers, but the reality is in 20 years, the market has done better than we see in terms of a negative sense. The only time you will realize these negative returns is if you pull your money out around them or you, you try to time the market and that goes against you. So again, long-term investing is the key knowing when to pull the plug, when not to, and knowing when not to be irrational. So let's talk about impending recession. Everyone has been talking about recession lately, that, oh, the economy is about to crash, really bad things are about to happen. Let me ask you guys a quick question. Does anyone know how many recessions has the US experienced since its inception as a country? How many recessions have we experienced? Anyone knows? Just throw out any number that you want, but it has to be in the chat.
Someone says five, Sean suggested five recessions. Some of the other is saying five recessions that we have experienced. So I am going to explain to you guys the definition of a recession. Two consecutive quarters of, let's say, underperformance of a gross domestic product. For six months, the economy should not be too, doing well. Quite scary, guys, but I'm going to type this in the chat. That's how many we've experienced. 47 recessions in the United States. What does that tell us? They're surprisingly quite common. Although in the last sort of nine years, we haven't had any since the 2009 market crash. Why? Oh, Flex is the closest one. Yeah, he said 20 plus. That's kind of a cheeky answer, but he said 20 plus. <laughs> so that plus can take you near 47. That's smart. Um, so why 47? Well, the economy does perform in different ways, and that's okay. Um, I just want to make sure you guys are still able to see my screen as well clearly. So as I asked the question, basically two consecutive quarters of underperformance. So what is happening in our economy at the moment? The reason we did not enter a recession is because we did improve a lot of things. We saw that um, our economy has turned into what's called a gig economy, and I'll touch base on that in a minute. But the three important factors to look at when you talk about recession, number one is social security. It does rise as year by year, to be honest with you. And sometimes older people that are receiving social security now may not even need to use it because they have other means of income. I, I have an uncle who still works part-time as a consultant, makes money, gets social security, but he's not really using that money. For himself, he's reinvesting it back in the economy by certain expenses, travel, and so on. So social security is one thing that's looked at how it's being spent and used. Then payroll tax cuts, it may actually happen, and it just did technically, if you think about it. With everything going on with coronavirus, uh, filing a taxes deadline has been moved forward up until June now. Um, they're giving people various forms of tax break, and the stimulus check that will come for those that are in need, basically. That is a form of establishing money circulation in the economy. And then gig economy, what do I mean by that? 10 years ago when we were using smartphones, we were using it for primarily the purpose of showing off, I have a screen that I touch and things happen. But now you can run businesses through them. Things like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. Anyone can be a part-time Uber driver if they want to. Anyone can these days work through DoorDash and still deliver food even the restaurants are shut, they're not supposed to provide you any service, but they're doing home delivery. You can do that. A gig economy is an economy that allows you to earn income regardless of your surroundings in more ways than what? Beyond your actual regular job. And that is why in nine years, the US did not enter a recession because there were means for people to keep earning money. Doesn't matter how much you earn, but you're able to make your expenses meet. So these are the factors that are looked at when we actually truly discuss a recession. Currently, what we're going through is a unique situation. A virus comes into play. We are forcefully asked to shut down. If you guys look back in January and February, the economy was doing really well. Stock market was performing really well. People had jobs there. Everyone was, was great and happy. And suddenly, we're told that you need to put everything on hold. It wasn't like 2009 crash where due to uh, you know, mortgage bonds and so on, I'm not going to go into details about that, is that the economy actually literally crashed. Banks are doing well, financials are doing well, people are making good money, there are more jobs out there now than, than before. So the gig economy allowed us to capitalize on that. Coronavirus, basically due to which we had to slow down everything by force. So I call this a forced recession if it does come to that. And for that, we need to wait a couple of more months to see what happens. But the government is doing their part. They're offering a stimulus check to people, to small businesses and to corporations, uh, whether we like it or we don't, to, to keep them afloat in some shape or form. And, you know, there definitely can be some good things to come out of it. But the bottom line being, not always everything can be doom and gloom. No news is good news, but the news outlets are supposed to provide us the worst case scenario ever and then the best case at the same time as well. So these are some of the parameters you want to be aware of. You want to be in the know of before making any, again, coming down to the story of irrational decision-making and emotional attachment to your money and investments. So since we do live in a, a, a gig economy, we're being forced to slow down. This doesn't mean it's the inevitable. This doesn't mean that this will last forever. If we have experienced 47 recessions uh, in, in the US, it means they're quite common. And on average, they last about 1.8 months. So that's one year and eight months at the most and then they turn around. And I'm going to share some numbers with you guys about that as well. Um, by the way, if you ever want to look up this sort of information, Investopedia is a great resource. Do look it up if you're someone that likes to read and look into it. So current economic climate, 
There's an old saying actually on Wall Street um, that I like to quote from time to time, and I learned about it during my first few days at the job, that the market, and whenever you, you guys hear me use the term market, I'm talking about the stock market at large, goes up the escalator and comes down the elevator. So just try to imagine that with me for a minute. When you're going up an escalator, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening quite, quite you know, uh, sometimes slow, rapidly, but it's at a consistent pace. Consistently, you're going up one floor by another. When you're coming down the elevator, it's just a straight right down. So that's what happens in the market. It takes a while for it to go up, but it can drop quite rapidly. As long as you're aware of that, you're in a good place. So what did we notice recently? The global equity market had to slow down because of coronavirus that was discovered in China. Um, what we did not realize is how quickly it would rapidly expand. And it definitely created an air of panic in people, um, especially in areas like goods and travel um, and, and hospitality industry. They've been hit the worst by it. So I hope that none of you are in it, but if you are, if you know someone that's in it, I, I hope they're doing okay. I know it's rough times, but again, like I was telling someone recently, I was having a conversation and they said, ooh, I don't know what will happen to Southwest or Delta or United Airlines. I was like, what do you mean what will happen? They'll find a way to stay afloat. Do you think people are going to start, you know, using donkey carts next year to move from one part of the country to the other? No. The moment things improve, we'll start flying again. So th th their share price will go up again for these uh, airlines, if not now, then later. So we, we can't let negative news keep us away from reality. So yes, the virus spread, it affected manufacturing, supplies and so on. The stock market definitely erased some of the returns for this year that it had given. Honestly, it's, it has only been three months in this year. So every time I read in the market when they say, oh, the market has wiped out all the returns for this year, I ask myself, how many months have been this year so far? If it's three, I have nine more to go. So, you know, you never know. Think of it in the most pragmatic way you can. As of last month, guys, this is the funny thing, the market was still up by 27% from its overall high from before. Wherever it was in January, between Jan and Feb, it was still up 27% regardless. I think the lowest we were is 30%. When I throw out these numbers, it means from its very high, it was down by 30%. So at Wide Invest, we, we do have a portfolio management team and diversified portfolios. We definitely experience volatility. But we always tell people, Decide your investments based off your age and your risk tolerance. Someone who's young could potentially think that they're investing like a teenager. They have a long amount of time ahead of them. 10 years, 15, 20. They're willing to take market risk because to them, it's like a discount. And over the long run, it will pay off. Someone in their 50s or 60s should be more careful in wary should not be taking too much risk in the market, should not be gambling by saying, hey, I think I can take a risk by buying more stocks than bonds, basically. Well, then you're asking for trouble. Something like this happens. Why? You don't have enough time to recoup those losses. And that is where it comes down to again. Emotional attachment, uh, sometimes even greed. I hate to say it, and I've experienced it myself uh, with clients where people of much older age have been basically argued with me and said, I just want to buy stocks. And I'm like, well, you need to be careful about it because you don't have enough time to recover. A younger person will. So it's all about giving it enough time that it will actually work in your favor. So I do want to touch base on something that happened last week. So we've been, we've been hearing about this pandemic. Even I had clients that completely panicked, didn't know what to do. But last week, we had these two news uh, sort of news messages pop up. One from Business Week on the left, one from Yahoo Finance. Great resources. Business Week article really made me laugh. It says, as ridiculous as it sounds, the Dow just climbed out of the bear market it ended two weeks ago. Do we all understand what a bear market and a bull market means, by the way? Yes or no? I just want to know if you guys understand the definition of a bear market or a bull, but I'll be happy to explain it because I would know. Okay, great. So, a bull market means that the stock market is going up and up and up and up from its worst, lowest point. A bear market means that from the highest point of success that the stock market was at, it went down by at least 20%. 20%. 10% is called a market correction. 20% is a bear market. Things are slow. They're not that great. That's what a bear market means. And then literally a few days later, I saw this news out of pop-up from Yahoo Finance. Best week for Dow Index since 1938. Market graph for the week of March 23rd. This was a week ago where the Dow Jones was up by 12 points and S&P was up by 10. So in spite of what happened a few weeks ago, this shows us that the market is a very volatile place. Just like I shared the Dow Jones chart with you guys, 
this shows the reality of it. If, you, if people had pulled out their money a few weeks ago, the moment the market started to go down, they realized losses, but then they missed out on this, where they would have managed to potentially break even on whatever amount they were down by. I can confidently say that. Or gotten close enough to the losses where they could have said, hey, maybe in a little bit more time, I'll probably make the difference back. So what this teaches us, don't be reactionary, ever. That's the biggest mistake you can ever make. And that's something I preach all the time because I've learned from personal experience as a teenager investing as well. The more reactionary you are, the, the less fruitful results you'll have. So always focus on that part. So this shows that these days, anything can come up in the news. Monday, we might see something negative. Wednesday, something positive. So don't let all of that noise dictate your investments, your future of investments. Be more focused on your goals. That is what you want to primarily be most focused on um, as much as you can. Okay, so what happens when you miss your mark? So let's say, for example, guys, and I'm going to use some examples here for a hundred thousand dollars. Someone who invests a hundred thousand dollars suddenly realizes that they have lost eleven point three percent. If you do the basic math, that means you're down by eleven thousand three hundred dollars. So now your account balance is eighty-eight thousand seven hundred. Okay, from 100,000, you lost about 11.3. How much do you need to earn that money back? It's not 11.3. You actually need more than that. You need to earn 12.7% to get back to just $100,000 because of the loss that you've incurred. So again, what this teaches us is staying in the market, riding the wave is a much better strategy than pulling out and then reinvesting because you will miss the wave. Now, let's say if you have $100,000 and you lose 11.3%, your account balance comes down. So I've just put a repeat on this one to re-emphasize on the fact that this is what happens. The bigger the dip, remember this, the bigger the recovery needed. So if you lose 30%, which literally just happened about a week and a half ago from the stock market's high in January, compared to that, it was down by almost 30%, and drop, let's say from $100,000 to $70,000, you will need to make 43% to get back to 100,000. So if someone thinks and says, hey, I lost $30,000, I'm gonna take my money out and reinvest again when the market starts to turn around, it will take you much longer to just break even because you need 43% to make it back. In the history of the stock market, since inception up until now, the most that the market ever lost was about 50, 60%. That happened in 2008. And from then until January of this year, it was up by almost 495% return. That really means that looking less at those fluctuations and more about how can I achieve my goals is the ideal strategy to move forward. Um, the one thing I want to share with you guys is understanding the history of, remember I just discussed the definition of bear market and bull market. Just look at the numbers in green. It's basically showing you that let's say in 1937 uh, when the Federal Reserve created certain guidelines, the stock market was down by almost close to negative of a 60% technically, uh, which was the bear market defined as. But the duration, it only lasted was 61 months. And the next bull market gave 158% return. If we come to the very bottom, the 2008 financial crisis, we saw a negative 57% drop, but over 300% return within 17 months time. So again, the very simple purpose of showing this is don't be afraid when you see the market going down. Be afraid of your own reaction if it's emotion based. That is where you will regret the decision that you have made. And in spite of all the noise around us, in spite of the fact that yes, we're in rough times right now. Yes, we are all home working from home. I'm working from my home office right now. My wife is putting my two and a half year old upstairs to bed. About 10 minutes ago, he was screaming because he wanted me to put him to bed. And I was really worried you guys may or may not have heard him if you did just ignore it. So, but, but we make things work, right? The gig economy allows us to still work as opposed to 10 years ago. I may not have been able to host this webinar with Marla if I was not able to go into my office. So that is the beauty of technology that has allowed us to grow the way we have. So according to Warren Buffett, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Like now, if people are afraid of the market, it means it's actually down from where it was before. If risk allows you, or if you allow yourself to take that risk, it can actually be beneficial for you. So now that I've done a bit of a story about the history of the stock market, we understand the volatility, we understand what a gig economy is, we know the emotional attachment to money that we all have. Um, I want to talk about something that is really important to me when I talk to people about charitable giving. 
Uh, Mala is doing some really amazing work. We all know that. If you guys are a member of them, you follow them on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, you guys know how much hard work Zainab and Flex and their team have put in uh, to, to bring you great content, great value, and great service as well. What can you do to provide them support over the long run? The one thing that a lot of people tend to underestimate is called Donor Advice Fund or Charitable Lead Trust. What does that really mean? You're basically creating a vehicle whereby you can designate a fixed amount or percentage of an investment value that can be given to them until the foreseeable future. Say you decide to invest $100,000 over 10 years and you say 10% of that 100,000 every year should go to mother. That will happen. You will get a huge tax break the same year you opened that donor advice fund for those 10 years because you opened it with the intention of giving a portion of that money away. So you're basically giving away a portion of that balance. Uh, donor advice funds are similar to endowments. Endowments are what nonprofits set up as well, whether it's related to real estate or investments. You're basically potentially aiming to provide a, a certain rate of return on investment that allows the nonprofit to keep doing their work and allows you to set up something for this world and for the world after as well because you've left something behind something a lot of times people ask me hey i've got a group of friends or my family wants to set up some kind of an investment to donate money to a charity of our choosing say you your friends or your family members are thinking about doing that for mala you can set up what's called a giving circle it's similar to a donor advice fund where individuals or groups donate either their time or money in a pooled fund so you're, you are investing that together to a non-profit and that way you are constantly able to give them something from their bucket of money uh, this is this goes way beyond guys of just doing regular uh, funding uh, sorry funding requests i've been part of various non-profits i'm currently a member of muppies muslim urban professionals for dc I hate the fact that I see our mosques and nonprofits always, always focusing on fundraisers. We, we, are, we should be way beyond that. There, there's a fund called the Jewish Communal Fund, and I'll very, very quickly cover that. The Jewish Communal Fund has over $3 billion in the tri state area in New York. No Jewish nonprofit or a small business needs to borrow money from the bank. They just go to the Jewish Communal Fund and they get whatever they want because of the strategy that they built using donor advice fund approach and that's what i will highly emphasize that you guys should do as well now very quickly one last question people sometimes ask about donor advice fund is there a minimum requirement not really you can start with you know whatever amount you're comfortable with and then you set up a required distribution amount say five percent of your assets um to be given to Marla, for example, every year out of that $100,000. How can you set this up? There are various organizations out there, investment banks, like whether it's Charles Schwab, like a brokerage firm or Fidelity. I personally like the American Muslim Fund, just because I know them and because their donor advice funds are very well structured. They, they designate the charity of your choosing to be given money to them. They work with us closely. They use a Sharia compliant investment fund in it as well that gives a dividend income. And now most of you know what dividend income means as well since we discussed it. But do not underestimate the, the value of a donor advice fund and why should you create it? Like we said, you can use real estate in a personal business, investments from like stocks and shares. You can give appreciated the stocks as well as a donation to Mala if they have a DAF set up and you get a tax break on it as well. So in reality, charity does help our pockets back as well in more ways than one. We just have to be smart about it. You can create it as a legacy for a family. My father has been thinking about this way. He's like, okay, my dad is 75 years old. He lives in Houston. He's like, well, as and when I die, I want to make sure a portion of my income is constantly being given to a local masjid and local charity of my choosing. So even when you pass away, that money which is being invested, a portion of that is still being given out to that charity, which is being used for various causes. So again, here and thereafter is what you're celebrating this for. It can be done for milestones as well. I've had clients in the past, when I was at Morgan Stanley, they came to me and said, my uncle, my aunt, my mom, my dad passed away. I want to open a charitable trust in their name, and I want to donate a portion of that money to this particular charity until the foreseeable future. So there are many ways to take advantage of donor advice funds, private foundations, and so on. So make sure you guys do that. Look up American Muslim uh, Community Foundation, like I said. Um, uh, you know, re reach out to um, Mala as well. I'm sure they can guide you in the right direction, and I can also help them with it. But do not shy away from setting up a charitable lead trust or donor advice fund, supporting Mala in that, helping them with their cause and endeavors of what they're doing. And you know, it's benefiting your pocket as well because you're going to get a massive tax break from it. Okay, so very quickly, 
now that we've talked about most of the things, what kind of investments can you make? Not in terms of type of investments, but what type of accounts can you open? The most popular accounts that most people open, whether it's through Wahid or elsewhere, first one is an individual account. This is basically, think of it as liquid as it gets. You put money in today, you can take money out tomorrow, no restrictions, no dollar value limit. But it's a taxable account. You have gains, you pay taxes on it. Retirement accounts, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, uh, there are certain limits on them. Uh, I think the current limits per IRS is $6,000. If you're under the age of 50, that's the most you can deposit in it per year. The investments you can choose. Remember we discussed index funds? Smarter uh, strategy than actively managed mutual funds. You're paying less in fee, more comes back in your pocket. Uh, if you're older than 50, you can actually contribute an extra $1,000 and put it up to 7000 Roth IRA, by the way, remember this Roth, it does have income limitations. You, can, can, you guys can look up the IRS website and see if you fit the bill to open and contribute to a Roth. It's tax-free. The gains are completely tax-free in it. That's the beauty of Roth. Uh, traditional IRA is like your retirement account at your employer. Whatever money you put in, you may get a tax break on it. Now, when you find your taxes, do you speak to a tax specialist about it. But when you retire in the US, the age is considered 59 and a half, after which you can tap into your retirement accounts and IRAs, you'll pay taxes on the entire amount. So think about it in a smart way. One service that I'm a big proponent of for people in a higher income bracket is backdoor Roth. It allows you to deposit money in a Roth through a traditional approach without the limitations. Um, I'll be more than happy to fill you in on that at a later time or you guys can look this up as well. SEP IRA, any of you who are consultants, you might be a doctor or a physician or a lawyer uh, or an engineer that works on their own, you probably should consider opening a SEP IRA for your business. It gives you, uh, again, a tax break on the amount you put in it. Uh, look it up on the IRS website. The limitations are either 25% of your overall income or 56,000, whichever is less and you get a tax break on that amount as well. 401k, 403b, uh, retirement accounts. The amount of times I've worked with people who said I've been working somewhere for a number of years, but I did not open a retirement account just because I was afraid of what I was investing in. I mean, it boggles my mind. If your company gives you a match, take advantage of it. If you're not sure what to invest in, most employers, the custodian, by custodian I mean Fidelity, Schwab, to your price, whoever they're using to set up your 401k, they will have a financial advisor uh, with that platform attached to it. And they can actually provide you advice and information as well on what funds to choose. Ask them about ethical funds. Look up one thing, I'll give you guys a tip. Self-directed brokerage link, it's a mouthful. Self-directed brokerage link. That will allow you to invest in any fund outside the selected list of funds that your employer has given you if you want to be more faith-based and ethical. You have kids, do you think about their future as well. UGMA, UTMA, Uniform Gift for Minors Act, Uniform Trust for Minors Act, Coverdale, these are all college education accounts. 529 plan, a lot of people are familiar with this. It's a state-based plan. The state you live in is where you can open it potentially more often than less. You're, you don't have the flexibility of selecting the investments in it. More often than less, they're predetermined. So be aware of that. One last thing I'm going to leave you guys with before we open up for Q&A. It's okay, so Saad, you've told us about different types of investment accounts. You've told us the market is volatile. We know what's happening with COVID-19. It's a forced slowdown of our economy. But at the same time, if we stick to our guns and to our goals, eventually we should be okay, even though we are seeing this current volatility in the market. It will never last forever. The smartest way to invest, because a lot of times people ask this question, how much should I start with? And honestly, I don't have an answer for that because I don't know what your pain point is. Pain point meaning how much are you willing to potentially risk in the market because the market risk does exist. Dollar cost average or a recurring deposit approach is the smartest way. Why? Because you come up with a fixed amount, whether it's 100 bucks, 500 bucks, $10,000, whatever the amount be, a fixed amount you invest on a bi-weekly, monthly, bi-monthly basis. So it helps you out. I'm going to read an example out to you guys. Oh, sorry, it came up too soon. Let's say investor A decides to invest lump sum $40,000 on January 1st at $50 per share. So each share is costing you 50 bucks, so you invest $40,000 lump sum. Investor B decides to dollar cost average over 12 months, so of $40,000. So he's gonna divvy up $40,000 over 12 months at a rate of $10,000 on a quarterly basis starting January 1st. He's buying shares for the same price, 50 bucks to start with, 
and he's investing in the same index fund as investor A. Investor A has put money lump sum, 40K, done. Investor B says, I'm going to deviate it up and invest $10,000 every quarter till I reach my $40,000 mark. How is that going to work out for both of them in December? Let's look at lump sum. Lump sum meaning investor one. He ended up buying 800 shares. Um, and let's say at the end of, the, of December, his share price was $35, down from 50. He bought at 50, now he's at 35. His market value happens to be $28,000. His loss, $12,000. The percentage on that is 30%. That's quite staggering. He invested lump sum, didn't do anything else, let it be. Whereas our friend, Investor B, that did dollar cost average approach, divided up 40,000 over, uh, over the whole year, ended up buying 958 shares instead of 800 shares. How did that happen? What happens with dollar cost average is you take advantage of when the market is going down. So he did, or she did, $10,000 every quarter. They first bought them at $50 per share. Maybe he or she then bought them at $40 per share then bought it at $60 per share each quarter, the share price might be fluctuating in value. But that person decided to invest a fixed amount of money over a period of time. That allowed him or her to take advantage of the downturn in the market. So he or she was able to buy more shares for the same money as opposed to when the market was going up. I hope that makes sense. And price is the same, 35 bucks for both. But look at the market value, guys. This person's actually up by $33,000, technically. Their market value is more than 28,000. Why? Because of the number of shares the person owns. The loss is staggeringly much less. 6,000 only compared to $12,000 and a 30% versus a 16% change. So you're mitigating, limiting your risk by being a smart investor, by consistently investing over a period of time, taking advantage of the downturn in the market, for the same value, you're able to buy more and then taking advantage when the market is going up when it's too expensive and you can kind of reduce that risk as well. Market risk is always there, cannot be ignored. But dollar cost average, especially in days like these, it's far better than investing lump sum because you can invest 100000 today and a week later you may completely freak out because your portfolio might be down by $20,000 because we're going through so much volatility right now. And until the coronavirus issue is resolved or there's a vaccine or we all go back to normal and suddenly realize everything is great around us, it may continue for a while. Doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Uh, we've still seen, like I shared with you guys, the market news that a few days is down, a few days is up. Take advantage of that wave. And the only way you can is through dollar cost average, index fund strategy, stay diversified. Don't let the market news and this noise decide your investment future. Look into charitable lead trust. Look into donor advice funds. See how you can support Marla through all of this and everything that they're doing so that a part of your income is helping them achieve their goals and for you to get a massive tax break on it as well. If you guys have a CP or a tax consultant, talk to them about donor advice fund or charitable lead trust. Um, look up American Muslim Fund's website as well. One last thing I want to leave you guys with, Warren Buffett. I'm assuming most of you have heard of him. Most people have of Warren Buffett. Hopefully, yes. Um, I love his quotes, because the man has made most of, his, most of his money from the stock market. So we're gonna go from the left to the right, to the down, two ones. One of the things he said about savings was, don't save what is left after spending, but spend what is left after saving. A really smart way to be good with money management as well. Um, by the way, I'm working on creating a few courses moving forward on money management and skill sets of how to apply different strategies to save more for yourself. So hopefully um, at some point I'll collaborate with Mala on that as well, inshallah. Um, the stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. This, excuse me, this has already been proven when we were looking at the Dow Jones chart. If you're hasty, you decided to pull your money out last week or two weeks ago, you wouldn't be sitting where someone is who's already still invested, maybe incurring a paper loss, but not as much as someone who did three weeks ago. So patience is a virtue. If you buy things you do not need, impulsive spending is what he's talking about, soon you will have to sell things you need. And this is so, so true. Even these days, we're stuck indoors. We're at home. Guys, we can be saving so much more money by just eating at home buying food from the grocery store, maybe once in a while getting, getting a delivery in, 
taking advantage of a gig economy and helping someone earn a few extra bobs from their DoorDash service or delivery or Uber Eats. So you have all of that around you. Take advantage of this time to better improve your money management skills, looking at your budget, how you can you know, do better uh, for yourself and for those around you as well. And then more importantly, by periodically investing, we're talking about dollar cost average here, fixed amount of money over a period of time in an index fund. Whenever you guys think about investing, ask yourself, am I investing in an index fund that is passively managed or an active managed fund? And what's my fee on that? Because your fee will accrue over time. Imagine if you're paying 1% somewhere over 10 years, that's 10% in fee you've paid versus half a percent somewhere, which is just 5% over 10 years. The difference comes back to you. Um, so if an index fund you're investing in, the know nothing, someone who does not know anything about investing, no clue about how to buy and sell stocks, but invested their money in index fund using a dollar cost average approach, those investors can actually outperform most investment professionals. And this is a fact. Active managers can do really well in these kind of days when the market is down, but they're charging you an extortion amount of fee. But we've seen the Dow Jones chart over a period of time, the market goes up and it has a tendency to give back to those who are patient. So I hope I didn't go over time. I hope that that was useful. Some of the stuff may, I may have gone through a bit rapidly, but it's more about putting things in perspective about what's around us. How does that affect our mindset? How does it affect our pockets in reality or not? And I hope that this was a value. I'm gonna let Flex take the stage uh, from here on, and then we can address some questions that you guys have uh, been asking us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Saad. This was, um, you know, highly informative. Um, took me back to my uh, counting and uh, finance days. So <laughs> counting major at Loyola, and I, you know, uh, as previously mentioned, I worked in, you know, hedge funds and more on the accounting side. But I did, you know, um, work at uh, UB, uh, UBS as my first job, you know, out of uh, college. So I almost went the complete, you know, um, finance, you know, side and the wealth management, you know, side of the, the world that you're in right now. And um, so in the, uh, right now, I, I have a couple of questions for you, and then I'm going to go into the audience, sure. you know, questions. Some of the questions that I've prepared, you know, I can see in the chat and then the Q&A that some people have similar, you know, questions. So the first question, you know, that comes to mind is you have, you know, a lot of people reached out to us and some of these folks are first time, you know, investors. Okay. So now going back to when I was out of college and I was working uh, for UBS and um, wealth management and I was working with a gentleman, you know, who managed, you know, a lot of money for a lot of wealthy, you know, folks, um, the first thing that he would do is he would have people answer a set of questions, you know, to, you know, basically figure out their risk uh, uh, tolerance. And then, you know, from there, um, look at, you know, what, uh, how their, you know, portfolio would, you know, shape up, you know, we, we had a software that, you know, at um, UBS, you know, as, as, as well. So I'm curious, um, you know, so this was back then. So I'm curious how have things, you know, evolved now in, you know, 2020. And if I'm a first time investor, you know, what is the first step and what do I need to do? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, knowledge is power. Absolutely. And I think these days because of technology and smartphones, we have a lot more information at our hands. But that doesn't necessarily mean we know how to use that information effectively. Um, if you're a first time investor, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, um, you know, what sort of an investment I want to do and what are my goals? Uh, investment you already know you're going to do in stocks, for example. Don't try to be, uh, you know, someone that can buy and sell individual stocks on their own. Don't do that, even though you can use tools like Robinhood, which are great for individual stocks and funds. But go for a passive strategy. Use an investment firm that gives you a diversified portfolio between stocks, some commodities like gold, and then bonds. At my firm, we use Sukuk, which are Islamic bonds, because they're more profit and loss shared rather than interest. We try to avoid that part. So for someone that's a first-time investor, definitely look up Investopedia. Great resource to learn from. Try not to jump into buying individual shares, first of all. Uh, use a platform that allows you a diversified investment platform with index funds in it. Index funds, like I discussed before, if it's S&P 500, you get all 500 stocks in a bucket. You do not need to think about it. 
you just see how that performs. That's probably the most smartest way for a lot of people who are first time investors to, to start rather than thinking, hey, which stock should I buy? Should I go for Amazon? Should I go for Apple? Uh, should I buy some other stocks? Like in these days, a lot of people have been reaching out to me and saying, what do you think about Clorox? I'm like, I actually called out Clorox about a month ago in one of my tweets, actually, by saying, hey, people are buying a lot of Kleenex. Let's keep an eye on Clorox. Doesn't mean it was advice, but these are systematic stocks that only perform well when certain environments allow, allows them or enables them or their companies to do really well. So don't go for stocks that are seasonal in such sense. Think more long term, look into diversified funds. Index based funds are much better. There are a lot of ethical, faith based, socially responsible funds out there. You can look into those as well. Uh, Investopedia is a great resource, uh, and so are we um, on that purpose, basically. Thank you so much, um, Sadab. So, my next question um, is the topic of emotional attachment. You know, there's you know, in business, we talk a lot about, you know, emotional intelligence, you know, but when your money is tied in to anything, you know, emotion, emotions are always going to be, you know, at, at play. So um, I was looking at those quotes, you know, that you had with uh, Warren Buffett. I'm a big fan of Warren Buffett. Um, one of the things, you know, that he says is invest in a business, not a stock. Exactly. And so, um, what are the ways back when I was in, um, in, 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 in finance in, in the past and when I was working at UBS is I would look at, you know, uh, Morningstar, for, ex uh, for example, and companies, uh, you know, um, like that to really get to understand, you know, the, the business and, um, and, and what, and, and, the, and the stocks. So my question for you is, you know, in terms of the emotional attachment, like how do you, how do you mitigate that? You know, when, when things are, when things are happening and, you know, and CNBC is showing you all these, you know, all the volatility that's happening, you know, every day, what, 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 what do you advise people? When oh, absolutely. It, it's very tough though, because you are tempted to pull that trigger and say, I'm not investing anymore. To your point earlier, uh, Flex, uh, Morningstar is still a great resource, by the way. Morningstar.com is a great uh, unbiased kind of a website where you can punch in names of different funds and look up their performance and history. For, for using Morningstar, you need to know what you're looking to invest in. But when we have so much noise around us, go back to data, go back to history. That's why I shared how the stock market has done in the last 20 years. Whatever is happening now will not continue forever. Just like I said earlier, just because we're not flying right now doesn't mean we'll be using you know, scooters and donkey carts and whatnot next year to commute from east to west coast. We'll still use airplanes. We'll still use you know, current public transportation eventually. So it's all about asking yourself the question that, okay, where do I stand in my life right now? What are my personal goals? And if I pull the trigger now, how much is it going to harm me when I try to re-enter the market? Again. Those are the things you, remind, you have to remind yourself. And knowledge is power. If you look at data, you look at history about how the stock market has performed for over 140 some years that the New York stock, the stock Exchange has been around for, it will tell you that over time the market does give returns, but it's all about timing of when you decide to pull that plug, not when you decide to invest. There's no good or bad time to invest. You can invest a month ago, you might be down in value, but if you're a 10 year, 15 year long term investor, Inshallah, over time, will be just fine because we've seen that historically. So I always tell people that, look, the only way to fight your emotions is to ask yourself, why am I investing? What is the purpose of that investment? I mean, imagine if tomorrow you had an argument with your boss and you get emotionally charged up by that and you say, screw this, excuse my language, but I'm, I'm going to leave this job now. I'll go and find something else. You can't survive like that. You learn how to deal with different people in different ways. Same thing with the market and your money as well. Focus on your goals. Focus on what, you know, is beyond what you're looking at right now, this negative noise, because it wasn't here in January. Everything was great. And again, realizing that currently what we're in is a forced form of slowing our economy down. When, when things go back to normal, stimulus checks come out. That in itself will boost the economy a little bit more. We don't know how long this is going to last for. No one has a magic ball. I don't. My colleagues don't. No one does. But we're just making various predictions based on historical data. But this is a very rare situation we're in. So again, focusing on your goals, knowing how old you are, how much risk you can take is probably the best way. 
Thank you so much, uh, Saad. And I also want to recommend a uh, book for everyone. It's not necessarily an investment, you know, book, but it's one of my favorite uh, authors, and it's called "Start with Why." And you know, reading, 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 you know, books like that, you know, help help you sort of understand um, what is what is uh, what is your mission, what is your business mission, what's your life's mission, and and from investments, you know, you gotta you gotta look at. What what, uh, what uh, why are you investing? So I com I completely understand you know what you're saying, and that takes away a little bit of sort of like the emotions you know that are you know happening right now. Um, my last question you know um, for you is you know a lot of our uh, community members are you know folks that are entrepreneurial. Um, as you're familiar, um, we work together on an event um, around diversity and um, inclusion. And, you know, I personally experienced, you know, um, y, y, uh, Y2K and I was a computer, a computer science major earlier in college and there was no computer science job. So I switched, you know, to accounting and then, uh, and then, and then there was 9-11 and the housing market crash and now we have a, you know, recession. So you touched a little bit on you know, the gig economy and the gig economy that we're in, um, that we have right now. It's sort of like helping us with, you know, the pandemic and everything that's going on, you know, like Zoom and all the other products. What, 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 is your, what is your message for people right now, you know, thinking about, hey, should I start a business? Should I, you know, create, you know, something in, in you? Like, do you have a message for any of the entrepreneurs that are here? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think someone who has worked with startups and I sometimes advise startups as well uh, on growth and so on, there's, there's never a time not to do that. Um, I think right now is a great opportunity in that sense because people are kind of recharging themselves right now. Companies like Slack was created and accepted in 2008 right during the, 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 the pure market crash. And right now, Slack has like millions of users using it. My company uses Slack for example. So a lot of companies have surprisingly come out of recessionary phases. I think you should take advantage of this time to really perfect your art of product. What product are you looking to offer? How can it benefit the community at large? Uh, and not just think of it from when you think as an entrepreneur, don't think about it from a money point of view, but more what kind of a value you can bring, you can give people. So I think absolutely now is a better time than any other to take advantage of the slow progression of the economy because eventually when we go in full force, we will, you want to ride that wave. So don't shy away from coming out with a service or a product where you think people will be in need of or will actually need it for whatever purpose that may be. Um, and I think entrepreneurship is what makes things go around, whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Zoom, entrepreneurs created these products to make our lives easy. And the smartest way to think about it is, even for Wyatt, when we were created, the idea was not to create a platform for just Muslims to invest in. Yes, that was the story behind it. But how do you find a solution to a problem where people can invest any dollar amount they want, $100 and up, easily in line with their faith? So that's how it was created. So same thing with that. I don't think one should hold themselves back, take advantage of the slow pace right now, and really focus on what you're trying to create and produce and how that can benefit the um, communities at large. Thank, uh, thank you so much, uh, Saad. I appreciate, I appreciate that. And it's very in uh, interesting with, um, you know, you mentioned uh, Slack um, earlier. It's a relatively new uh, company and Mala, we launched in 2015 and Slack was one of the first tools that we used. And at that time, <laughs> Slack was still in uh, beta. So it was mostly like Silicon Valley tech people that were using it. And we, we had um, probably anywhere from 10 to 20 interns at a given time collaborating on different projects that were benefiting Mala. So the way, you know, we, you know, built our organization is around, you know, remote work and so, and it's a social, you know, um, ent enterprise. So that's very interesting that you uh, mentioned Slack. I also do want to say that um, we're, we're part of one of our donors uh, and partner organization, Investnet Yodli. We're going to be doing a series of uh, webinars. Um, uh, with them, and there's one that's going to be uh, coming up uh, next week, uh, April uh, 7th, around the topic of uh, remote uh, work. 
and you know how to how to navigate you know the it, how how your business can navigate the current corona you know uh, virus. So there's definitely going to be a lot of you know important information for people that are you know entrepreneurs as well that are working you know from home. Um, with that being said, um, I'm gonna now go to the uh, Q and A, and I do have um, you know a couple of questions uh, for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, aside from the uh, from the audience, um, and you know, one of the one of the questions is, can a donor advice fund be considered zakat, or as a zakat? Um, as a zakat, well, I mean, most investments can be defined as part of um, uh, zakat, depending on who you're giving it to. Um, for that, I would highly recommend. I can't personally comment on that because that's a good question. That someone is asking, but again, you're probably investing in for the cause of a charity. I will, I will suggest speak to a local scholar or an imam of your local mosque, maybe, to get a confirmation on that. Because remember, this money, you, as long as you intend not to bring bring it back to yourself. But sometimes, what people do, they'll set up a donor advice fund for ten years, say of a hundred thousand dollars, five percent of that, say for example, every year is given to Mala. That's fifty percent of whatever amount the 100,000 creates from that investment. At the end of 10 years, they collect the remaining balance back for themselves. Then you can't really call it zakat because you're collecting the money back. But if you intend to just leave it perpetually until the foreseeable future, kind of changes that situation. So depending on the narrative of the DAF, uh, I would say it can go either way, but do speak to a scholar about that to say, hey, I'm setting this up, but my intention will be at the end of when the DAF timeline ends, whether you're gonna use that money for yourself or not, or let it invest, it could potentially be based off that. Uh, Joe Bradford, great scholar based out of Texas. I've had the pleasure of speaking with him. Uh, Sheikh Yasser Khadi, uh, he was actually one of our ethical advisors. I've worked with him as well. Uh, search them on YouTube. I'm sure they have information related to this, or you can even reach out to them, to them by email and maybe get an answer um, on that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And for uh, folks that are not Muslim, that are not familiar with the term uh, zakat, uh, can you give a quick definition of what it is? Uh, yes, it's basically a portion of your wealth that you give away to the DD. Uh, it's done once a year, um, basically about at a rate of two and a half percent of your overall wealth. And you say, hey, I've earned over a certain amount of money, that's part of my income, and I'm going to give a portion of that away to the community at large that needs help. So it's almost like community service and support that Muslims are meant to do from their income, basically, if they've earned up to a certain amount that justifies it to be part of zakat giving. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, the next uh, question is, is backdoor uh, Roth also referred to as a re-characterization uh, and is it still permitted in 2019? It's permitted every year for 2019 or for any year. It has to be done before April 15th. I mean, this year, of course, the dates have been changed uh, to help us to deal with coronavirus. So I'm assuming the IRS may or may not comply with June uh, with the June date for that. But no, recharacterization just means that you are changing how you define an investment from a traditional IRA to a Roth. Backdoor Roth is literally finding a legal way to say, I'll put money in a traditional IRA, but I make a lot more to open a Roth. That money does not get invested, stays in cash, and then gets moved into a Roth account for you. Recharacterization is used in different ways of looking at traditional Roth in general to say, hey, how much money I've invested, how much I have, do I overpay into it or not? Two completely sort of different things. Don't confuse recharacterization uh, with um, a backdoor Roth. That's why, it's not, that's why I never mentioned recharacterization. It's literally just purely defined as backdoor Roth, finding a way to move money from traditional to a Roth without the implication of not being able to open a Roth in case you make more money than you do to be able to allow to open a direct Roth account. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, I don't think I have any other uh, questions from the Q&A, but folks, please uh, type in your um, questions if um, you have questions for uh, Saad. Um, Saad, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question for Mayan in the meantime as we wait for sure. uh, folks' uh, questions. Um, one thing you mentioned is, you know, don't consistently look at the media. Don't necessarily, you know, keep your eyes glued on, um, CNBC, not necessarily CNBC, but just the news and the cycle of, um, a cycle of, uh, news. Can you tell us, um, you know, right now, and of course this is not you giving any financial advice or anything like that. Um, 
what stocks are you seeing right now that are you know doing great in in this current you know uh, recession? I mean, this is an assumption of mine, but I think if you are a cloud you know company or a you know, or Zoom, you know, you're probably doing well right now. Oh, you absolutely are. And just like I said earlier, when I gave the example of Clorox, uh, tech companies are doing pretty well right now, surprisingly. Anything that is related to cloud, telemedicine related, where doctors can use uh, you know, virtual or FaceTime services to be able to talk and look at their patients, those companies are doing well. LabCorp surprisingly went up in value recently as well, just because they said that they may come out with tests where people can you know, get the coronavirus test done there. So it's very situational that we're in, but we're definitely seeing technology companies that are supporting remote work are doing surprisingly well. A lot of cleaning uh, companies related with this Clorox and others have done well as well, but doesn't mean that they'll do until the foreseeable future. That is the individual stock selection. If you're looking at index funds, some index funds are sector-based, tech-based, um, healthcare-based, so healthcare is overall un as under pressure as they are. They have potential to be doing pretty well as well just because of the support that they're getting. But definitely anything cloud-based, remote work, technology that is supporting people to work remotely uh, are doing surprisingly well right now. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, um, insight. So, you know, looking at um, some of the um, our demographics in terms of, you know, Mala, we definitely have a lot of young, you know, professionals that are um, involved with the um, organization, and there's not necessarily everyone is in uh, finance. Um, so. What would be, you know, if, because obviously right now with everything that's going on, you know, people are at home, they have a little bit more time, you know, to pick up a book, you know. Do you have any book, you know, recommendations to help sort of... Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I was so glad that when you recommended yours, that's a really good choice. But the one I will say is called Common Sense Investing. It's actually available online as well. You can download it as an ebook. Common Sense Investing is the easiest read you can have to understand the basics of investing and how to apply logic rather than emotions when investing. So a personal favorite is common sense investing and I would highly recommend that anyone, especially those who are, who are not from the investing field or do not know much about investing, should ever read on that book. It's a light and easy read and should definitely be read by almost everyone. Excellent, excellent. Thank, uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, another question along those lines would be, you know, is there a particular podcast for example that you um personally enjoy yourself or you know and uh, people can listen to um oh my god uh, particularly i i do listen to news podcasts even though i'm about to contradict myself they don't listen to negative news but bloomberg is great in terms of educational material they give um tony robbins actually has a great podcast in that he talks a lot about finance and investments as well. And he actually interviews very successful individuals. So Tony Robbins podcast is awesome, not just for self-development, but from understanding an investment point of view as well. Um, there, there's so many out there sometimes related to money that not all of them have value. But Bloomberg's is great because they're very straightforward, very direct about it. Charles Schwab has started one as well recently, uh, which is really good that people should listen. It kind of covers the day-to-day -day market um, as well. And then Tony Robbins, I'll say, that's a personal favorite. I listen to it every morning when I used to drive to work. So now we're all working from home. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great one um, as well. And who knows, someday I might actually venture in that space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you, def you definitely can do that, you know, because we're, you know, enjoy enjoying learning so much from you uh, today. So Thank you. if you ever uh, start a podcast, definitely let us know. We'll promote it. And <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much. Part we'll participate, you know. And it's interesting, you mentioned uh, uh, Bloomberg and uh, um, when um, we were starting, you know, uh, Mala, um, and even before that, I used to watch a lot of uh, Bloomberg West. And yes. that was the show that basically kicked off a lot of the, you know, Silicon Valley, you know, companies sort of like the Web 2.0 um, generation, you know, so that, that was my uh, cheat sheet, you know, that's how I would find out about some of these uh, new, you know, tech companies that are, had their freemium, you know, models and, you know, you can tap into and yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, because they, because they need you too, a, eh? because they were getting, you know, funding, you know, to um, acquire, you know, more use uh, more users. So they had to show numbers and, and they needed the data points. So 
um, I helped uh, model, you know, Ma uh, Mala, you know, from the knowledge that I got through Bloomberg, um, you know, especially Bloomberg West. But I think now the show is called uh, Bloomberg uh, Technology. So anyone that's listening, that's an incredible um, show, you know, uh, t uh, t to watch. And, you know, technology is not going, you know, anywhere. And it's going to be constantly, you know, disrupting, you know, business and, you know, and on the topic of uh, technology, uh, Saad, you know, are you all considered a fintech company? Yes, we do fit that parameter because we started as a technology company. It's funny when you said about that, Bloomberg, not many people know this, but they started as a tech company and then went into the finance space, basically. So yes, we are definitely a fintech firm. We do fit the parameters. Uh, since everything we do is 100% digital, uh, the accounts are open online, the services provided online. So we, we fit the parameters of the, uh, the fintech space. I work personally with a lot of our UI, UX designers um, that basically do all of our sort of, sort of web work and content work and so on. So I pretty much got thrown into it coming from the advisory space into fintech. So I definitely learned a lot about the technology side of the, uh, the business as well. Awesome. And, and just for folks that are not familiar with the term, you know, fintech, can you tell us a little bit about um, what, it, uh, what it is? And also, um, in terms of, you know, the Muslim world, why is now uh, fint, uh, fint, uh, fintech, you know, so, uh, so important? Sure. So technically, when you hear fintech, you, you basically should remember financial technology a method of being able to take advantage of the economic surroundings around us in terms of investments in banking through technology. That is what in a nutshell FinTech is. I think the Muslim market is massive in America alone, you know, based on a few numbers I'd seen a few years ago, close to about 5.2 million Muslims back in 2011 was estimated live in America. Maybe we're close to 5.8 to 6 million now. A lot of our uh, Muslims are faith-based. They are very ethical in their mindset. They want their investments to be that way as well. So a fintech platform allows you to take advantage of your own faith-based investing values without leaving the comfort of your home. That is what financial technology does. It allows you to take advantage of technology within the financial services sector, within the banking sector that resonates with your values. And that's what we created, being the first one in the United States to actually offer a Sharia-compliant or ethical investment platform uh, with diversified portfolios uh, for Muslims to be able to invest in with the comfort of knowing that, hey, I, I'm, I'm investing my money to people that have my best value at hand, which is my sort of faith-based values. So FinTech in a nutshell, financial technology banks, investment firms that are providing you a technological um, sort of outlet from which you're able to invest your funds. No, abs uh, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. And that so with 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 you all, are you uh, with Wahed? Are you all international? Is your uh, um, business mainly in the U.S.? How does how does it work? Uh, it, it's it's quite international as well. We started in the U.S. Uh, about two and a half years ago in New York. Um, we have over twelve thousand clients just in the United States alone right now, and I think our largest client base is in Malaysia. Uh, when we launched there about two months ago, so they're kind of making my team look pretty bad right now. So I have to do something about that. Um, but it's all in healthy competition. We are also in UK. We launched in UK about a year ago. And then soon in the Middle East, in Dubai, Saudi Arabia, and that region. Um, uh, but recently, we launched our platform there as well. So we are pretty much a broad-based company uh, through our website. We have access to about 130 different countries from where people can actually invest their money uh, within our international um, uh, platform as well. No, that's incredible. It's very fascinating. I mean, you know, we've gone through a lot of information, you know, today, so we might have to reach out to you again to have, you know, very specific uh, web webinars on. Oh, some please. would love to. Absolutely. Any way I can help you guys out, by, by all means. Absolutely. I do have a question from the audience. Um, question is, what are some of the long-term effects the COVID-19 uh, virus will have on the financial markets? That's a great question. I think it's definitely teaching the non-ethical side of the market how to be ethical, meaning debt and leverage. The biggest reason we have a stimulus package come out to support the corporate America is because a lot of them leverage debt. They, they have bonds, they issue bonds, and now they have to make repayments on them or they have to find a way to support themselves. I think the biggest effect we've seen of something like coronavirus, which was most unexpected, is how to be prepared for the unexpected. 
And that comes from being more financially savvy, being more business savvy, not always relying on debt-based instruments or just bonds, but more equity based investments as well. And I think that's what keeps us unique. Um, for those of the listeners who, may, who are Muslim, is that our faith-based value investments allow us to do that. We do not invest in banks, we don't invest in insurance companies, even though banks have been doing pretty well, but now if they struggle, their stock price is not going to affect our portfolios. If the overall, overall stock market is down by 30%, my most conservative portfolio is only down by say 3.5%, which is not bad at all. Again, you're limiting risk. But the overall long-term effect will be how companies are going to start leveraging debt and finding cash balance to it is something that a lot of corporations will look at. Is it going to slow down the economy a little bit? Absolutely. Is it going to put us, uh, put us on a standstill forever? Definitely not. Um, j- just because that's not how things function. Uh, I-, I was telling someone recently that someone asked me that, hey, if I invest my money in an index fund, can it, my value go down to zero? And I said, well, if an index fund has about 220 to say 500 stocks in it, what you are technically telling me is that all of those companies will completely crash and crash and burn and will not exist anymore. Apple, Google, Amazon, all other big companies, Salesforce, Slack, they will cease to exist. That is not possible because what you're telling me is that the US economy does not exist anymore. Yes, we're going through a turmoil now, but doesn't mean it's going to go down to zero. And that is something the federal government will not let happen. It may slow down that growth, that progression, which was very much needed because the market was so up for the past 12 years. There's helping the future generations reap rewards from this slow but steady growth. Again, slow and steady wins the race. So the biggest ramification, debt-based investments will definitely be looked at very closely, um, I believe, in the future. Got it, got it. And uh, I have another question for you. What is the safest type of investment at this time? (laughs) Uh, To be blunt with you, no such thing. If you're thinking about investments as safest, um, uh, I don't know if you will survive long-term investing then. Um, (laughs) Because again, I I did cover something called market risk, which is always there. Um, If you invest in an index fund, I'm a big proponent of it, is better than buying individual stocks. Why? Say, for example, you buy five stocks. They can all go up, they can all go down. They can all go down to zero. But if you're, if you're investing in an index fund, which is still safer, I can confidently say, compared to individual stocks, is because you are opening up your options more. You're investing in over 200 stocks. We launched an index fund called Halal HLAO last June, and that has about 200 plus stocks in it. So if even 80 or 90 stocks are going down, I've got another 110 stocks that are helping me leverage my potential long term return and give me a dividend income as well. So index funds is a much safer approach rather than individual stocks. They may still go down in value, but not as much as individual stocks will do. But there's no such thing as 100% safest investment. The safest investment ever, technically, is putting your money in cash, but I personally don't believe that cash is king because what you can buy today for $10, you will not be able to a year from now. So that sort of economics of that and inflation will erode the value of your cash as well. So be smart, diversify, look at, individ- look at more diversified stocks. And the one thing I'll add to it, think core and satellite strategy. Your core strategy is you're using an investment firm, a fintech platform to invest for you. Your satellite strategy is where you may buy a few individual stocks where you're willing to risk that money in its entirety and be able to play it in the market. With. So you're kind of outweighing your options. So that's a better way to look at it. Got it. Um, okay, the last uh, question. So with your app, um, you mentioned that you are in other, you know, uh, countries around the, in, around the world. Um, for, for folks that are non-US citizens, um, are they able to, you know, sign up and use your um, service? You know, um, so how, how does that work? Or is there any, you know, restrictions in terms of you know. uh, sure. Um, on our US platform, yes, there is. Um, just because of our sort of guidelines and key performance indicators and the KYC, know your customer process that we have to do with our custodian. A non-US citizen who may have a green card and a social security number, for example, cannot open an account on the Wahid US platform. Uh, but if they are from a country and their country is represented on our website, then they can open an account based off that. Or you can take the other approach of opening an account with Fidelity, Tura Price, or uh, Schwab and other platforms, like even Robinhood, 
for example, and you can buy our ETF if you want, Exchange Traded Fund, Halal, HLAO, and invest in that that way. But through our platform, if you're looking to invest in the US and you're a non-US citizen, unfortunately for now, you won't be able to. But if you're from a country and our website shows that country, then you can select that and open an account to invest with us. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, well, I think that's um, the end of the Q and A session. I don't see any um, questions. Um, no, and Andrew, do you see anything that I'm, I'm missing? No, I think uh, I think we've covered everything at this point. Okay, um, um, awesome. And um, yeah, I just want to say uh, thank you, Saad, for um, helping us put together this presentation today on such a short notice. Uh, we truly appreciate you. And uh, with everything you know that's happening um, right right now, it's definitely um, much appreciated for you uh, supporting our organization and our and our work. And um, together, we're going to get uh, through this uh, period together. Um, one thing I uh, just want to say at the end is, uh, you know, Andrew, do you want to give uh, maybe a couple of updates and maybe some events that we're working on or things that are, you know, coming up uh, for Mala on the horizon that people should, uh, you know, think, uh, think, uh, put on their, uh, put on their calendars? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we'll be hosting uh, next week on, um, Monday, April 6th, uh, we'll be hosting a panel with um, a doctor who is working um, out of a hospital on uh, Long Island. Um, and we'll be sort of speaking with him about his experience with the sort of COVID virus. Um, and he'll be explaining sort of the, the uh, you know, what we know about the virus now, um, what projections he's sort of making, um, and then also um, doing some sort of myth busting, helping people understand how to stay healthy and safe. Um, so that will be uh, April 6th. Um, you can register for that um, by going to our website. Uh, the link is should be right here on the slide. Um, Flex, I know you're also um, participating in the first of a series of webinars uh, with, with Investnet Yodli. Um, Next week, yeah, and that's, and that's going to be set, and that's going to be sent out through our um, newsletter um, this week, and it's going to be um, 11 a.m. Pacific, um, 1 p.m. Um, Central, 2 p.m. Eastern, um, and it's going to be on April seventh. Uh, Excellent. Um, so more to come on that. Um, I also would just encourage everybody to check out our website, uh, malanational.org. We have a banner up on the front page um, that's clickable to um, all of the resources that Mala is offering during this time, um, specifically regarding the, the uh, coronavirus situation. Um, that includes, you know, programs that we have in the works. It includes um, also a micro grant program that we are uh, that we've started this week um, to provide assistance for specifically for small business owners, for freelance workers. Um, so that's available uh, at the link here as well. Um, and would just encourage people to please, you know, stay in touch with us. Um, you know, we miss, we miss seeing your faces. Uh, feel free to reach out with questions or suggestions um, or just to check in. We'd love to hear from, you know, our community members. Um, yeah, thank you so much, yeah. uh, and Andrew, uh, for the uh, for the updates. Uh, Saad, uh, real, uh, real yeah. quick, um, before I, I let I let you go. Um, again, I appreciate every uh, everything. No, thank you so much, guys. This was an absolute pleasure. Um, in, in regards to um, the services that uh, Wahid Invest, you know, offers, um, we did have a question on the ETF, you know, offerings and you know, um, sector and industry focus um, ETFs and, you know, what you guys are planning to offer and what you guys are planning to expand on. Um, is there something you can touch on, you know, quickly? And also, um, if people have further questions, where should we refer them to? 
Absolutely. Um, first of all, thanks so much, guys, for this pleasure. This was a, an absolute honor to be part of you guys and, and to host this webinar, and I hope it was useful for people. Yes, we are absolutely looking to introduce uh, more products, especially in the ETF space, because we are a big proponent of index fund strategies similar to Vanguard. That's what makes them popular. I personally like to see us the Muslims of Vanguard in in the future. So we have uh, uh, something related to uh, perhaps real estate that may come out, something related to Sukuk Islamic bonds that may come out, and other product lineups that we're working on. I can't give a timeline or date due to compliance um, reasons. And if someone wants to look at something, they can most certainly go to our website, whiteinvest.com, uh, flex if you want, selectively for the audience that has attended this webinar. They can share, you can share my email with them and I'll be happy to forward them to my business development manager or senior account executive as well who specializes in retirement accounts and so on. They can address their queries. One last thing I'll say, the one thing that ethical investing teaches us is how to support our communities through our returns on investments. The one thing that Wahid does for all investment accounts is called purification. Any amount of money through stocks that may come in your portfolio which should not be there, which may come from impermissible investments, you're supposed to donate that money to a charity of your choosing. We have 12,000 clients. I'm going to be actually educating them about Mala as well in my next uh, corporate webinar for our clients. But for those of you who support Mala and perhaps either have accounts with us or know someone that has an account with us, or is going to open an account, we create an annual report. It may be a very small amount that you may have to give in purification, could be just a few dollars. But imagine if tens of thousands of people collect that money together every year and give that to Mala as well, you're supporting their cause and, and their service as well. So always think of it in a, in a bigger picture way that with investing, it's not just money that's coming in your pocket, but what more can you do for the community that you are a part of as well? Excellent. Thank you so much, Asad. We really appreciate you. And I want to thank everyone that for joining us today. And like I said earlier, this is going to be one of uh, many. Uh, Mala is a tech company at heart, you know, so we're going to bring you as many, you know, webinars that you all can uh, digest. So thank you so much for spending your time with us in your evening and um, have a good night. Thanks so much for having me. Take care, guys.